This episode is sponsored by Horizon Capital, an M&A and micro-private equity firm that acquires and grows SaaS companies. Horizon Capital only works with SaaS companies generating between 500K and 5 million in annual recurring revenue, where they help them unlock the true value of their business and scale to the next level. Whether you're ready to move on to your next startup or want to work with the right growth partner, Horizon's team will work with you to find the best structure possible. From M&A strategy to capital investments, SaaS is all they do. Simple as that. If you're a SaaS founder with less than $5 million in annual recurring revenue and are looking to sell your business, visit horizoncapital.com today and get a free valuation. If you'd like to sponsor the SaaS District podcast or recommend any guests that you think would be valuable to be on the show, visit horizoncapital.com slash SaaS dash podcast today. Thanks again, folks. Hello, hello, everyone. This is your host, Akil Jabbar, and welcome back to another episode of SaaS District. In today's episode, we'll be talking about how to make instant demos for 22x sales effectiveness and conversion improvement. Today, we have our guest, Yoe Sigurdsson, joining us. Yoe is the founder and CEO of Crankwheel, which is a bootstrap B2B SaaS company that provides a screen sharing solution tailor made for your sales team. In the past, Yohei spent 23 years in the software industry, from which he spent 10 years at Google and the rest working at different startups. Yohei loves to write about entrepreneurship, technology, management, and whatever comes to mind on his personal blog, which is yohesig.com, and also writes on the Crankwheel blog, mostly about sales, best practices. Welcome, Yohei. Super excited to have you on SaaS District today. Thanks very much, Akil. I'm very excited to be here. Awesome. So, uh... For the obviously, we like to start off try to understand our guest. Uh, can you share a bit about a bit about your personal background and uh, a little bit what you did while working at Google for seven years? And along with that, I'd love to understand. You know, you know, working at a big company, obviously, people are you know world renowned company. What are some you know valuable lessons and takeaways you took while while you worked there that you apply now at your startups? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I uh, I started in the software industry way back in '96. Uh, I sort of. Uh, Gradually left university, never finished my degree. Um, started working for one of the first internet startups in Iceland. Uh, and um, yeah, after that, um, co-founded uh, a startup, uh, co-founded sort of another one, um, worked as a CTO um, at a couple of startups. Um, and um, at one point, I uh, moved to Canada to, uh, to work for a high-tech startup called, called Green Border. And um, uh, the team of us uh, in Canada, and, and actually later the entire Green Border team um, joined Google. Uh, so, so that's how I got in there. And um, uh, yeah, Google. I, I was a, a tech lead for almost my entire time there, which is sort of a project manager slash sometimes decision maker, uh, uh, but it still involves you know programming every day, pretty much, and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so that was very enjoyable. Uh, the projects I worked on uh, initially was it was Google Desktop, uh, which was you know search for your own computer. Um, it was actually a, a very uh, it was a great project and, and used by a lot of people, about forty five million uh, people every week uh, at its largest. Um, after that, there was uh, I had a stint on Google Toolbar uh, for a couple of years, and uh, and then I worked on the Google Chrome project. For the remainder of my time, and and part of that time on uh, the WebRTC implementation in Chrome, which is what enables um, things like um, well, the video conferencing within a browser, essentially. Uh, so that's sort of my my track record at Google. And, and soon after leaving Google, I, I founded Crankwheel with my co-founder Gilsey. Um, at Google, yeah, there's the, the, there's some lessons for sure, um, especially in the early days at Google. The teams were incredibly small for the number of, of users they were supporting. I'll take the Google Desktop team as an example. I, I don't think we were ever more than about mm, 20 something people. Uh, and that was everyone who, you know, really re- like built the product, ran the product, marketed the product, tested the product. 
Um, and most wow. decisions could be made sort of, you know, uh, autonomously within that team. And still it was like a product that, uh, as I said, at, at its peak reached about 45 million users every week who, who were actively using it. Um, I learned a lot from uh, from the founder of you know that project within Google, uh, Steve Lawrence, uh, who, who was um, a mentor to me uh, at the time and and a uh, great guy. Um, and one of the things is just how much you can really get done, you know, with a tiny team, or even just you know how productive just one person uh, can actually be if you're very very focused and um, and really discard a lot of the, the maybe the less important things uh, that. Mm-hmm. end up on your plate all the time, but aren't really that important. Right. So stay focused and prioritize is probably, yeah, sounds simple, mm-hmm. right? But super, super important. Um, so you worked at different startups. Um, you mentioned, you know, as a CTO, you know, uh, you know one in Canada. Um, what, can you speak a little bit more kind of, you know, what, what happened? Did you, was there some learnings there? Like were, were these companies early stage? Were they, you know, uh, VC backed? Were they, did you, you know, did it lead to some kind of exit where they, you know, did they fail and maybe something you mm-hmm. can, uh, share in what you learned from there? Yeah. Yeah. My first startup uh, that I joined as an early employee, uh, I think there were 16 of us when I joined, um, I was 20. So, you know, I was one of the young kids, uh, joining and, and the, the uh, ancient, so to speak, founders were like 27. Uh, <laughs> um, good friends of mine today, um, uh, and um, yeah, that was that was VC backed, and actually ended up in a in a pretty significant exit. Nokia ended up buying that. That was that was a few years after I left uh, that company to do something else. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, one of the one of the startups that where I f- I feel that I learned quite a bit in terms of uh, a failure was was a, a sort of a spin out from that company where. For myself and a colleague of mine, we were sort of uh, co-founders, you know, but it was backed by the the mothership. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was in the year 2000. And, um, you know, everything was going crazy in terms of, uh, um, you know, the dot-com bubble and all that stuff. And we started that company in like March, uh, February 2000, which I believe is probably if you sort of, you know, if, if you look open the history books, that would probably be the month you should not start a company. Uh, <laughs> uh, because, you know, uh, all the VCs, that was supposed to be a venture backed thing. And all the VCs sort of started pulling back, uh, March, April, May, you know? Um, mm-hmm. so that was quite a ride. We, we, we were in California with that company, uh, trying to raise money. And I think one of the things I really learned there was, um, uh, because before that I figured you need to plan for success so that you can deal with the success that comes, right? You, you, like mm-hmm. you need to build for it, you, not just the product, you need to build the team for it because you're going to you know, grow so amazingly well. Um, uh, but the thing is, if you, if, you, if you do that and then if the success does not come as fast as you were hoping, mm-hmm. then you are in trouble. Um, so that doesn't mean you shouldn't plan for success. It just means you really need to balance, um, you know, planning for the explosive growth that you're envisioning and, you know, making sure you have enough money in the bank and so forth. Uh, so, you know, there's, there, it's just one of the most important things to balance when you're, when you're running a startup and, um, you know, even with Crankwheel, which is, which is bootstrapped or, or I should say self-funded at, at the start and then bootstrapped, um, you know, there, there have been times where we, uh, grew a little bit too fast and, and very painfully had to scale back a little bit. Um, mm. So, you know, even with a bootstrap company, it's it's a danger. With a venture-backed company, it, it is a big danger. And and uh, I think sometimes the VCs or the, or the people backing you can, um, you know, push you a little bit too aggressively and you need to, you need to have the wisdom to um, sort of grow at a pace that makes sense where, where, uh, where you at least can, you know, come up for air, see how you're doing, see if your projections are making any sense. And, and if they're not, you know, um, uh, respond to that early rather than at the very last moment that you can. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, right? I think a lot of people, you know, over-engineer and overestimate their actual growth. And I mean, it's, I think it's, you said, like you said, it's okay to over maybe engineer a little bit, but um, you've got to be realistic with kind of what the the, the, the real kind of, uh, you know, revenue growth is actually happening or user growth and mm-hmm. then try to balance it. Right. But then, I mean, you can also be the other side where you said where you're underdeveloped. I mean, you built kind of something like an MVP or a smaller product or prototype. And then, you know, you're, you're, I guess then you have that drive to push and then it's easier, I think, to, 
to to try to grow from there than uh, overspending up front, up front, right? Yeah, it's it, well, it's a very delicate balance. I mean, as you said, you can underdevelop. You can have a, a product that's really not good enough, and and then you are trying to market that, and and you learn very late that you know, or or you sort of takes you time to get back and to improving the product. So you you can both mm. over engineer and under engineer both your product and your team. Uh, yeah. So it's just a it's just a thing you need to learn over time, I guess. But there are dangers in both directions. Sure. Yeah. So it's a good yeah. balance to, to work on. Cool. So um, let's let's talk about Crankwheel. Can you describe the process of you know building that company from a little bit from you know idea to launch? I think that was in 2015. So you're almost mm-hmm. getting close to six years. Um, what was the opportunity you saw? Because you said you were, I believe you were working at the time. What was the motivation? What was the problem you saw in the market so clearly that you know needed to be solved there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I actually left Google uh, with an idea to build a company, which is not Crankwheel. Uh, I left with a with a sort of more typical ex Googler kind of uh, let's build some infrastructure that Google has and build it on the outside and and, and you know build a company around that. Um, uh, and then I, I did more market research and I realized it, it had been done by people I actually knew and <laughs> with the same go-to-market strategy. So I decided not to go that way. Um, uh, so I was sort of searching for a few months uh, and uh, I reconnected with an old friend of mine. We, we were in like primary school together and, and I think we'd only met each other once or twice in the next 20 years after that. And uh, we sort of reconnected. That, that's Gilsey, my co-founder. Um, and, um, he had been doing sales, mostly like telephone sales, uh, some in person, but more, more telephone sales of, um, you know, uh, consumer and business products like, uh, telecommunications, insurance, um, banking products, uh, that kind of thing, uh, for like 15 years. And, um, and we sort of got to brainstorming for a couple of months, uh, you know, what's missing in the space. And in particular, you know, for salespeople like him, very much like him, uh, who are working the phone all day, um, maybe, you know, working with a team or building a team and trying to put in place processes and, and trying to get customers, you know, all the time. And I think we probably rediscovered uh, every sales uh, enablement tool there is and, and lots of lead generation tools and stuff like that. And, and we saw that they, they'd all, all been done. And then uh, I, I asked him what I thought was really obvious, which was like, so for salespeople like yourself, what do you use to be able to screen share while, while you're on a phone call? And, and he just told me that's, that's not done. Uh, you know. And I was very surprised. Um, and that's when we really figured, okay, we've hit on something here because both, um, you know, that's a huge market, uh, you know, telesales and, and, and inside sales, uh, especially inside sales has been growing like crazy for the last few years and, and uh, telesales growing very well and, and tons of people doing it. Um, and my background in terms of technology, uh, I was pretty, you know, I had a pretty strong background in uh, in the kind of technologies we'd need. I'd been working on WebRTC at Google or the Chrome implementation of that. And uh, before Google, some of the stuff I, I'd worked on was like instant messaging and, and uh, you know, multi-user chat rooms and, and very related technologies. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of what we hit on. And, uh, that's really been our guiding principle ever since is that we're building this for, you know, telesales people, effectively people who are on the phone all day trying to sell, uh, their wares, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Cool. And, uh, so that was the market you saw, you know, you built it out and then, you know, now, you know, t- where you guys are up hitting over, I think 640 K in ARR, mm-hmm. which from when, when I last checked in February, you're almost up. 73% and with less yep. than 1% churn. So high growth, low retention. I mean, that's huge. Uh, can you tell us maybe just a little bit, you know, the cost? So I think that's important because when you have the experience, uh, you guys mm-hmm. are a small team, if I, if I imagine. Um, wh- where were you investing in the initial stages to build that out? And, you know, we we're talking about that balance. How much yep. were you investing to actually get, you know, product market fit or at least enough to, you know, have a, you know, start getting some sales? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we probably invested in total um, about seven hundred thousand dollars, something like that. So that was part of that was uh, our own money, uh, so mine and, and also my co-founders. Uh, part of that was a research and development grant that we received from uh, uh, the Technology Development Fund here in Iceland that that helped a ton. Uh, they mm-hmm. do kind of a t- kind of a, a matching type of a grant um, if they feel that it's uh, you know R and D worthy kind of. Uh, so that helps a ton. So we pro- that's probably around the figure we invested over the first um, couple of years. 
And, um, uh, you know, after that, we had sort of decided we wouldn't be, you know, it, it would have to be profitable, the business. And, uh, and it did turn out that, that there was a point in time where, where we needed to scale back a little bit on the team or, or actually significantly. And it hurt a lot, but, uh, that was years ago. Now we've, we've grown again since. And, uh, and the, uh, our teammates who, uh, who, who we had to let go at that point, they, they landed in great roles afterwards, you know, so I'm happy for them. Um, mm. but you know, that's one of the things that can happen. You're, you're, you're running a business, you are spending faster than you're making money and you're projecting, you know, some level of growth and it doesn't turn out quite the way you want it. And, uh, you know, you can't really bridge the gap. And then there's, there's really only one way, one thing to do. Um, in the end, it turned out, you know, well for everybody, I think. And, uh, and we've really grown a lot since as a company and in terms mm -hmm. of our revenues. So, uh, we're in a good, sh we're in good shape today. Nice. So just to clarify, you guys were bootstrapped that 700 K was just entirely between you and your co-founder that invested in it. That wasn't from uh, actual revenue. No, about half of that. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we invested more in the, in the product itself, uh, from mm. revenue, definitely. Um, mm. but about half of the initial investment came from myself and my co-founder. And then a, the other half, uh, would have been the, the grants from the, the technology grants. development firm fund. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, bootstrap, there's a lot of challenges, right? When running that way, especially with, you know, that type of cost, um, you have to, you know, you have to grow, you have to stay alive in the early stages, um, mm -hmm. trying to find out your niche, find out the product that needs, and then that needs to be marketed going remote. And then I don't know if you were, you know, paying your guys yourself salaries to stay, you know, float over that time, or you're just using your own savings. Um, and then also deciding not to raise money. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share a little bit more about that bootstrapping experience and Maybe some sure. challenges in that stage as, uh, as, sure. as we're going through it. Yeah, we, we, we definitely didn't pay ourselves salaries for a, a big part of that time or, you know, and, and, uh, and very minimal salaries, uh, for long, long after that. Um, um, so that is, you know, you, I haven't calculated the numbers. You could definitely consider that an investment. There's definitely a, uh, market rate for both of us that, that was much higher than what we were paying ourselves. So, um, you know, that, that you could say that's an investment as well. Um, uh, today the, co the company supports us quite comfortably and, and, and is still profit and quite profitable. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, you know, it was a very, very long journey. I mean, the, the reason we always kept at it was that our customers were super happy We've always had very low churn, you know, so we figured, okay, even if we don't manage to make this grow very, very fast, um, with this low churn and happy customers, we're still going to end up with something really valuable. Um, it'll just take a little bit longer than we expected. Um, and I think that's what has happened. You know, we, we have, uh, extremely low churn, just about 1% revenue churn every month. Um, very happy customers. Um, and, and, and we've been growing, you know, faster over the last couple of years than we were before about 4%, you know, month over month, uh, which we're quite happy with. We'd like to find ways to accelerate that of course, but, but still that, that leads to the kind of growth you just mentioned about, you know, 70%, uh, just since February. Nice. Right, so speaking about that, that growth, uh, since launch when marketing sales and, and, you know, growth strategies, what would you say has worked best? Like what channel or what strategy have you seen to attract mm -hmm. and then also retain customers? Yeah. For us, that's, that's always been a challenge. Like we, it, we are very much a niche product that everyone w or most people will typically lump in with sort of web conferencing in general. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so, uh, for that reason, channels like search engine marketing, like buying, you know, keyword ads and that kind of thing have never worked very well for us uh, mm. because typically the keyword that people are searching and the only keywords that are, that there's sort of a bulk of, you know, 95% of those people are expecting to find something different from what crank wheel is. Right. 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 And, different and, intent. Yeah. 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 Different intent. So th that doesn't really work out very well for us. Um, what we've done that has worked, uh, there are several things. Um, one, one, one of the first uh, successes for us and which we've kept at, although we've not really been able to do that now for the last almost year due to COVID is just uh, to go to conferences that are sort of focused on uh, industries where telesales is a big thing. Um, and an example of that is we go to uh, 
like a Yellow Pages local search conference uh, in Europe called SINDA, S-I-I-N-D-A. Uh, we go to almost every one of their conferences, just, just as an example, because it's been a great source of, of leads for us. Interesting. Um, uh, so there are certain conferences that have worked really well. Um, other more sort of broad conferences tend not to work very well because it's again, the same thing. It's just, you know, very broad audience. You might meet a lot of people. Uh, sometimes they pay off, sometimes they don't. Um, another thing, uh, is content marketing. So we, we have, uh, I think it's probably two years now that we've been blogging every week before that it was like every couple of weeks. And so we have a, a weekly newsletter with, uh, about 40,000 subscribers. Uh, on the topic of uh, sales, so how how can you get better at sales um, in various ways? You know, uh, okay. last few months it's been a lot about like how how can you transition to working from home, doing sales, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. So that that has worked quite well for us, uh, helped us with our SEO, and and also just uh, you know brought up our profile at conferences also that we go to. So it sort of cross works. Um, and the other thing that I'm a big believer in, and I think we've done really well, is uh, just to provide uh, the best customer support that we possibly can. Uh, and I, I mean, I mean, we we really put our heart and soul into doing that. Um, you know, us founders, wow. our, our customer support lead, other people on the team. Um, it just makes a huge difference. Uh, it, it it's a lot easier to ask someone to to maybe write a review if they've had a great experience with you in terms of customer support. They're much likelier to recommend, and we we do see a lot of word of mouth. We, we, well, word of mouth. Uh, I know it's it's people always say that's not an answer in terms of you know what's working for your growth. Uh, that's right because it's hard to replicate but i think one of the ways to replicate it is to have you know good product and and fantastic customer support but we see right. a lot of word of mouth we see a lot of people moving to from one company to another and and sort of bringing crankwheel with them um mm. so that that kind of word of mouth um and then uh we've over the years we've really focused on uh, not just our website but also building our listing in the Chrome Web Store. So Crankwheel has, uh, t- uh, historically, Crankwheel has always been like a Chrome extension. Nowadays, yeah. it's Chrome extension, Microsoft Edge extension, works on tons of other browsers at, with an extension and also uh, most other modern, well, every other modern browser on a desktop as just a, a web application. You don't, you don't need an extension these days. Uh, but we get a ton of traffic from our Chrome Web Store uh, listing. And that's pretty much, you know, it, it's free marketing, quote unquote, yeah. Uh, sure. but it's not free because we've invested in it, you know, for five years, more than five, well, almost five years, uh, since we first listed there. Exactly. So I mean, it's an integration kind of channel. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I mean, so just, just a little bit to go deeper in that. So, you know, you talked about SEO, obviously that's working well, um, and then customer experience. So yeah, you know, you guys are, it sounds so simple, but you know, you're going a little bit over, sounds like you guys are doing more than kind of what the, the normal is and people, you know, you're saying word of mouth, but they're actually sharing the story. People get excited of like, hey, I actually got a really good experience. It's very rare these days that you get something above and beyond. And mm-hmm. that so, so, sounds so simple, but you seem to be, you know, it's quite effective that people tell somebody else that, hey, this company did, did something yeah. you know, above and beyond. So that, yeah, that's, if, great. that's great. If you, I mean, we, we really tried to help everybody out. Um, we tried to be very, very helpful and responsive also for our freemium users. So uh, you know, we have a, fr- a free for life plan uh, with, you know, it's it's basically a modest amount of usage. Uh, and if you never go above that, then you're, you can be free for as long as you want. And even uh, for the freemium users, we try to be as helpful and responsive as we can. Um, mm. You know, uh, a lot of other companies, I think, would just look at that as a, a, a burden of some sort or, or try to minimize, you know, uh, how, how they do that. Um, we we yeah. just try to help everybody out uh, as much as we can. And you'll see it if you go to the Chrome Web Store, you go to Captera, look at our reviews, you'll see, you know, customer service mentioned in like, you know, quite a lot of them. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. And then uh, you said, talked about the conference. So just quickly, are you guys coming there as as guests? You know, you're talking to people or, or what are you typically doing there to, to see results? Are you setting up a booth and, and you've seen results? Yeah. There? We usually try to have a booth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, we've sometimes joked that we could probably get the same results by not even paying for the conference and just going to the hotel sure. bar, um, you know, <laughs> in, the, in the hotel attached to the conference and yeah. just buying people drinks there. Um, 
but the, you know that, that, that it's humorous but it not maybe not quite but yeah we try to have a booth um uh, because uh, at most of these conferences, people are walking around, they are looking often for solutions or at least for something that could be interesting for their space. And, and so having a booth has, has usually been very good for us. Nice, nice. Makes sense. Um, and then, you know, talking about, you said people searching, they, they kind of lump you together with other web conference tool, conferencing tools. Mm-hmm. What kind of, you know, how do you guys stand apart and differentiate from, you know, people, sales people using other, you know, screen sharing tools like Zoom, Mm-hmm. Google Meet and other tools like being used a lot these days, like we're using right now. What's what kind of makes you guys different? Absolutely, I'm happy to cover that. Um, so, in one way, we are more limited. So, for mm-hmm. example, Crankwheel does not do uh, any audio at all, so or it doesn't do voice over IP like uh, most web conferencing would do, right? So, it is designed for a salesperson who's already on the phone with somebody and needs to change that phone call into something like a web conference without losing the person from the phone, right? So we do screen sharing. Uh, and you can also um, send like a video of your web from your webcam. So you can sort of be there in person as like a little overlay head on top of your screen share, just to make it a bit more personable. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're not like a full, fully fledged web conferencing solution that, that'll solve your every need. And in fact, a bunch of our customers... They might have Zoom or Microsoft Teams or GoToMeeting or similar solutions, um, you know, and be paying for those and also be paying for Crankwheel just because Crankwheel is a better fit for that telesales use case. Mm, mm. Um, so because we're a little bit more limited, in, in particular because the audio component uh, isn't there, we can support over 99.9% of all browsers out there without there ever being a download for the viewer, right? So mm. so the viewer could be on, you know, the person you're, you're talking to on the phone and you want to show them something while you talk to them, they could be on their old BlackBerry phone or they could be on like an old Windows XP computer. It'll still just work. You never have to worry about that. So, um, mm. you know, one of the things with salespeople is if, if they, they won't use tools that aren't 100% reliable, to talk to their prospects, especially if they have a prospect finally on the phone that that's been really hard to reach, they would prefer not to let that prospect leave the call without actually trying to sell them. Right. Um, and nice. definitely if there's like a technology they're trying to use and it creates some kind of a frustration or bad experience for you, for the prospect they're talking to, then they'll very quickly discard that because you know, you're on a sales call, I got you interested in, you know, in some, something that I'm trying to sell. And then I asked you to like transfer over to a zoom call. It didn't go too well. And now that's what you remember from that experience rather than being excited about purchasing the product or solution. Right. Exactly. Especially with, I guess, less tech savvy people. And there's a lot of them, right? I mean, big Absolutely. decision makers and yeah. Um, yeah. They, they, they probably don't even have Zoom. They don't want to go in and download something. It's going to take 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, you're not going to wait 20 minutes on a call. You know, you're trying to like get them to download this program or, hey, I'm going to send you this PDF file or presentation mm-hmm. and you have to download it. And then, you know, maybe they have an outdated version of, of Adobe and then they're like, you know, you're just wasting, you're getting them more frustrated. Yeah. Just and now frustration. it's just frustration. Yeah. Even even just something simple like, oh, let me send you a link by email, right? Exactly. You're, you're in a call. Maybe it's only a, maybe it's only going to be a 10-minute call. And you're maybe going to waste two or three minutes of that call just waiting for that email to arrive. So that's that's one of the other ways we're different is we have various ways of, of getting your the viewer connected with much less friction than sending them an email. You can, you can do that. You can send them an email. Um, if they're on their mobile, you can just text them a link. And you mm. just say like, you know, I just texted you. Could you click that link? I just want to show you something. And that's it. They just need to click the link. It opens in any browser, Pops any up. phone, just works. Um, nice. They're at their, at their computer. Uh, you can just ask them to type, type in like a very simple sort of a branded URL for your company. Um, mm. And it's not like a long URL or anything like that. It's just like, you know, some meeting is company name. That's it. And then they, they, they go through a two-step process, click your, click your photo, and, and they're connected to your meeting. Um, so we focus on ease of connection, compatibility, and then we also focus on uh, making the salesperson aware of where the prospect's focus is, whether, the, whether you're losing their attention and so forth. So you can see if, they are, if they're viewing your screen share and they're moving their mouse over it or they're tapping it on their mobile device, you can see where they're tapping or moving their mouse. If they're zooming in on something, you can see where they're zooming in. Um, 
if they, you know, if they're on their mobile and they like close the browser to go to, let's say maybe the Facebook app, you, you know, if you've been in a sales call, uh, e- either end, you've probably experienced, you know, where somebody's really just scrolling Facebook and they're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, so with Crankly, you can actually sort of detect that. You don't know what they're doing, but you know that you are told when their screen sharing viewer is no longer, like they're not seeing it anymore. Mm. They're, they're doing mm. something different. So you okay. can try to get their attention back, that kind of thing. Nice. Well, where, so speaking about, you know, the sales kind of uh, demos and qualification calls, where else are you seeing that these inside sales teams are, are lacking or they're, um, you know, not being as effective um, and what are some ways that which they can grow to improve those conversions and, and try sure. to close ideal? Sure. I mean, the, the, I think in terms of where Crankwheel is the most successful is also where I've, I see that there is the most opportunity to improve, um, you know, by using Crankwheel, I'll just plug it. <laughs> uh, yeah. but you know, um, it's basically when you, when you have salespeople who are selling to, Decision makers who are hard to reach, mm-hmm. but if you do reach them, they're likely to be able to make a decision, mm-hmm. right? When you're in that scenario, you definitely should not follow the standard inside sales playbook, which is, you know, BDR or sales development representative makes the initial call, does some qualification, and then books a meeting in the future, right? If, if that prospect is hard to reach, but can make a decision, you want to go straight for the kill, you know, mm. um, negative mm. term, you know, you want to go straight sure, sure. for explaining the product or service <laughs> to them and then asking for their business, right? Sure. Yeah. It, it could be a small business owner. They're notoriously hard to reach. They're incredibly hard to schedule and they probably won't show up for that future meeting. Yes. Um, you know, they, they mm. and, but they can probably just make a decision right there if you reach them. But you need right. to have the ability to show them your presentation or demo or whatever it is. Do the full pitch. Um, it could be a homeowner. That's a, you know we have industries where where they're selling to homeowners. Um, so you know that that homeowner can probably either make the decision herself uh, or himself, or maybe you know call their spouse and make the decision all together on a on a three way phone call. You know mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So you know. If you get them on the phone and you get them interested, you know, don't hang up on them until you've shown them the pitch and, and asked for their business. I think that's that's a huge one, and I think mm. a lot of businesses do this wrong. They they're just following a standard, you know, standard um, um, a standard process that was really standardized mm-hmm. for a much more sort of large B two B multiple stakeholders kind of scenario where the, where the sales can take months. Mm-hmm. But if they don't need to take months, why, why not just have them take one phone call instead of, you know, dozens? Exactly. And I think also adding to that, I guess when you're on the call, these people who you've you know worked so hard to finally get a conversation with, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of them may just push for, you know, A, you either push them to another call or B, you're like, hey, I'll send you an email and, you know, then you can review it. It's like they don't have the time and they're probably not going to take the time to you know, make that call you back and say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this. Right? Yeah, it's like, no, no, exactly. Let's, let's, let's do this, everything on this one call. Yeah. It'll also give them time to, uh, to look for other options. Yeah, exactly. Like, instead of you just yeah. helping them out and, 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 and fixing whatever problem they're having, just fixing it right there in the first call. Exactly. I like that. So you mentioned 21 X improvement and that's what kind of our, our the, mm-hmm. the theme of this story of this podcast is today. Can you share a story or, or two from any clients or anything you've seen yourself where you've seen that and where that was improved? And sure. what was improved here? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the 21X claim is based on a, a third party study done by uh, something called the Lead Response Management Institute. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, it's basically, it says that when you are, when you have inbound prospects who are asking to be contacted, mm-hmm. uh, that if you contact them within five minutes, uh, from the time they asked to be contacted, instead of 30 minutes or more, that's mm-hmm. all, you're 21 times more likely to qualif- get them to the qualified status, which means you reached them on the phone and you were able to qualify them. So, wow. you so- know, that won't necessarily lead to 21 times more sales, but it certainly puts a lot more leads in your pipeline. And uh, part of Crankwheel uh, is what we call instant demos which is a lead capture widget for your website, uh, where as soon as the prospect has entered their phone number and they start entering other answers to more questions, 
but as soon as they've entered their phone number, Crankwheel pops up an instant notification on every salesperson screen saying, hey, there's an incoming prospect. You know, you need to be first to click. I'm going to handle this one. And then, then you get to make the phone call. Um, wow. And when you do, if you need to screen share, you can just say something like, uh, you know, on the web page where you asked for the phone call, mm-hmm. just look there. I'm going to show you something. And the screen share just opens up right there in the same browser window. They don't, the wow. prospect doesn't actually need to do anything further. Um, and, and we see response times, uh, median response times across our entire customer base, everybody who's using uh, Crankwheel instant demos of about eight seconds from prospect entered their phone number until uh, the, uh, you know, the first agent has said, I'll handle this one, which means on the prospect end, it says something like, hey, yo is about to call you, please stand by. And, wow. le- and about 90 seconds average time until a call is actually connected. So what you're saying is, basically what I'm trying to hear, what I'm hearing here is, if you're able to get in contact with your lead within five minutes, mm-hmm. rather than 30 minutes or more, I mean, that sounds... Yeah, Very it fast. sounds it right. sounds incredible, but that is that is mm. what the research shows. Wow. Yeah. Twenty one times I, I, more likely to get them to the qualified stage. Nice. I will have yeah. to uh, I'm gonna have to try to validate that myself as well with our team. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, try it out. No, it's an amazing difference. I mean the, 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 the two things that it does is one, you, you get them while they are actually looking for a solution, right? Mm. So you're not frustrating them by having them like wait. Um, mm. and the other thing is you you know, they you're more likely to be able to just call them right away, offer mm-hmm. a solution to their problem, and you know, be friendly and personable and helpful and explain how your solution is great. And they are just much more likely to just go for it rather than spend, you know, days or weeks evaluating multiple different solutions and you know. Right. A- anything else you can share specifically on, you know, once you complete the demo, so you get them on, you mm-hmm. go through the demo. Is there anything you can do to, you know, keep their attention or persuade them and into not you know drifting away or turning cold after after that demo. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, a, a couple of key points that I always uh, try to try to persuade people to do if they're doing demos. Um, one is you know don't always do the same standardized demo. Uh, mm-hmm. So you know do spend a, a couple of minutes sort of qualifying or asking the you know prospect what what are their pain points. Um, and you know, you might do like a very small kernel of a demo, just the very high, don't try to like show all your features, that kind of thing. Just Mm -hmm. dig in onto the particular features that are going to solve pain points of your prospects and that they'll be, or, or, or you can just ask them, what would you like to dig into once you've given them Mm -hmm. a very high level, you know, image, um, try to make it interactive. So one of the ways is to just ask them, what would you like to see next? Another way would be mm-hmm. to grant, give them remote control, something you, you can do through Crankwheel so you can have them sort of kick the tires during the demo. Mm-hmm. Um, another, another really nice approach that I, I like to use is um, <clears throat> once you've given a demo and once you're into more of like, um, let's figure out if, if this is, you know, if, if we can ask for your business, uh, I like to have like an interactive calculator, and this this can just be a, a an Excel spreadsheet or a Google Google spreadsheet, um, okay. where you have them fill in the sort of assumptions in the calculator with you, and then mm. you know outcomes outcomes like how much money is this going to save you, or how much more sales are you going to get with this approach, uh, with the same without any other you know additional expenses or whatever. Um, that, mm. uh, that makes it really interactive and it's, it's an opportunity to also learn more about their business because the assumptions are, you know, information about their business. And right. the, fin- the final thing I would say is just never, ever end a demo without actually asking for their business in one way or another. I mean, that just might mean, you know, can we wrap this up now? Are you ready to make a decision? It, it might mean asking who else is in, needs to be involved and when, when would be a good time to set up a meeting? You know, right. n- never, I mean, uh, I just see so many times people just end a sales call. Well, thank right. you. And I'll be in touch. Mm, you know, exactly. Don't, don't do that. Um, I agree. It, it's just, you know, it's not helpful for anybody and, and it certainly won't uh, help you move business forward. Yeah. So as for that, go for the kill. Don't, 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 don't stop from that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So just kind of going on a personal level here, uh, Yoy, uh, what's, what's, uh, one advice you wish you had known and would tell your, say, 25-year-old self, maybe after joining a couple of uh, those startups, or I, don't, I think you were mm-hmm. joining Google at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
um, yeah, I, yeah, I was a bit older when I joined Google, but, uh, okay. um, you know, I would, I think I would definitely tell myself and, and I would tell any, any, uh, entrepreneur, um, or anybody just in a high stress, uh, work environment, you know, programmer, uh, any, 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 any high stress work environment and certainly entrepreneurs, um, you know, uh, make sure to, uh, take the time to, uh, you know, take care of your health at that age. It's, uh, uh, mm. I wish I had, I never, I never regret stuff. Like I, I, I try never to have any regrets about the past and I, I usually don't. Um, but I, I, I would certainly say, um, it, you know, at 25 is a great time to make sure you are in a good place re- with regards mm-hmm. to health. I am now, yeah. but there were many years there were, you know, uh, mm. I, I wish I'd been in better health, uh, young when I was younger. So that for sure. Um, and the other thing I think I wish I, I would have known then is just keep it simpler, you know, um, mm. simplicity is uh, a huge key, I think, to, to making a lot of progress, uh, especially, um, without necessarily taking on funding and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Love that. Um, and, you know, speaking of that, what, what are some, you know, challenges you guys are facing right now in order to, to continue to grow Crankwheel, you know, now that you've had this lessons and wisdom, uh, mm-hmm. behind you, how are you applying that and, and what are you seeing to help you stay focused and grounded? Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're still a very small team and, uh, I actually wrote about this kind of approach that I, um, I advise, you know, founders to use in the early days, which I, I, I call it like the spider web entrepreneur where you're starting, like, okay. it's just, it's just you or you and your, you and your co-founder and you're sort of at the middle of the spider web. And then yeah. you're sort of doing these, uh, spokes, which are, are like your contractors or, or VA and that kind of thing. And then you start, you know, building connections between the spokes where you're having them actually take care of things without everything flowing through you. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, I, with Crankwheel today, we are, uh, very close to the point where we need to scale up from that, right? Uh, we need to, uh, we're needing to add some talent, um, so sort of department heads, quote unquote, uh, to really take care of certain areas. Probably marketing is the, is the first one, um, mm. where, uh, I, I really need someone to sort of just take care of that. And I, and I don't need to spend too much time on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the big challenge is just finding the right talent. I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it makes such a huge difference, um, who you bring on board. And in particular, I think for this kind of, uh, leadership or executive type of role. Absolutely. So just to clarify, it's just the two co-founders and then who else do you have on your, how many people do you have on your team? So right now there's, there's like four of us who are full time. So nice. uh, us, my, myself and the, and my co-founder Gilsey and, and then we have uh, we have a full time programmer, full time customer support lead, and then we have about five other people who are part time but doing work every month. So it's it's still a very small team. Very cool. Good good mm-hmm. job. I mean, for the size you guys are at, that's 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 a good uh, uh, place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, Yoi, who or what are three best resources? This could be books uh, or people, you know, mentors or people you follow mm-hmm. who you'd say have been instrumental to your success over the last few years. Yep. Um, so I think, uh, a long, long time ago, I, I read, a, read the book, start small, stay small by Rob Walling. This was while I was at Google, I think, uh, really before I started thinking about leaving Google. Uh, although I did always know I wanted to build a company at some point myself, for, you know, mm-hmm. from scratch, um, mm-hmm. you know, not as a co-founder or as a spin out, but really, really mm-hmm. from scratch. Yeah. Um, so that was, yeah, by Rob Walling. I still follow like startups for the rest of us, uh, microconf, uh, Rob's, uh, you know, podcast and stuff like that. Really, yeah, uh, lots of inspirational stuff there. I've been also been following a bit Arvid Kal, uh, the bootstrap founder, um, more recent like success story that he's sort of talking about and he, he's starting a new company now. And then in terms of books, um, over the last few years, really influential for me has been uh, Company of One by Paul Jarvis, Mm -hmm. uh, Built to Sell by John Warlow, and Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, Crankwheel doesn't really fit neatly in any of the buckets sort of that they're talking about, like Built to Sell is all about building a business in order to, or building a business in a way where you could sell it at any point. And Mm -hmm. that's not really what we're, you know, planning to do. Um, and same thing like company of one is really about, you know, building a solo person business. And that's not what we are either and not planning to stay, uh, this small forever. 
Right. Uh, but there's lots of really, really great advice in all of those books. Absolutely. Yeah. I, well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do. I've read some of those. Um, I'll, and we'll add those to our show notes for people to check out as well. Uh, thanks for cool. sharing that. Um, so, you know, you've had an exit, uh, you know, you've, you've, you've grown you know, significantly in the last few years. You guys are doing quite well right now. But what, what would you say now at, at this age, what does success mean to you today? Whether that's personally, financially, you know, just general life. There's no right answer. Just curious what your, mm-hmm. your opinion. Yeah. So uh, I, I really love working for myself or, you know, you know, Gilsey and I work for each other, I guess. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, working beholden to no one except for our customers, uh, I think is a great situation to be in. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's still, it's a ton of work. There's a lot of stress from time to time. Um, but it's great fun. And, um, you know, being able to be really, really excited about, you know, your work when you get up in the morning is, is just a privilege. Awesome. Love it. So thank you, Yohi, uh, for joining SAS District. I know you offered our users, our audience, a specific uh, kind of a discount code or promo code where they're offering, uh, Crank is offering two full months of unlimited free usage rather than the usual one. So we're going to add that link to our show notes uh, with the coupon code. I think it's SAS District. But you guys can just click on it and uh, sign up directly. Um, Yohi, what, what are some future plans for Crank Wheel and where can our audience get in touch with you to learn more about you? Um, yeah, I mean, future plans for Crankwheel, we intend to continue to grow. Uh, it'll, it'll be more and more of a challenge to keep up like a four or five percent, you know, month over month growth rate, but we'll do it for as long as we can. Um, we, we have some big plans, um, that are still all around the kind of prototypical customer that I mentioned, like it is, it's a department of, of telesales people. That's sort of our ideal customer. Mm-hmm. Um, things like being able to collect, uh, more statistics from your salespeople to know, you know, how, how are things going, uh, what's working and that kind of thing. Cool. Um, and also just general improvements in robustness, per, uh, performance, stability. We're, we're always working on that continuously. Um, um, sorry, what was the uh, other w- part of the question? Uh, <laughs> where, where can people get in touch with you? Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. So, so, so I write some of the blog posts on the Crankwheel blog. So that's crankwheel.com. Uh, slash blog if you want to go straight there. And uh, then I have a personal blog, uh, com J-O-I-S-I-G.com. And I think you'll put that in the show notes where I sort of, that's sort of more about my journey as an entrepreneur. Although there's there's all kinds of stuff there. I mean, there's recipes there and stuff. It's it's an old school internet, you know, personal homepage. Nice. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining SAS District. I appreciate it. Thanks, Akil. Right, yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you all for watching this episode and joining SAS District today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for future episodes where we interview top leaders in the SAS industry. If you're a SAS company looking to grow and unlock the true value of your business, get in touch with us at Horizon Capital and myself or one of our consultants will provide a free assessment to help you get there and hit your goals. If you have any feedback or suggestions for this podcast, please comment down below and help us improve our content for you all. Thanks again and see you on the next one.